Hello, um, my name is Jürgen Konchak. I am a professor at the University of Minnesota. And today I'd like to address the question, can vibration of the larynx become a symptomatic treatment for spasmodic dysphonia? I have reported on some of this work last year, so some of you may remember uh, me and my presentation of last year, and today I'll give you a short update of where we are. So let me start out by um, characterizing the laryngeal muscle activity. So here we see a person, allow me to turn on my pointer here, who speaks a sentence, we mow our lawn all year, and we'll see the um, muscle activity, electromyographic recording of laryngeal muscles that give rise to this speech. And you can compare this to someone with laryngeal dystonia, spasmodic dysphonia, and also saying the same sentence, and you see uh, the acoustic signal is different. And without being an expert in electrophysiology of muscles, just looking at the differences in activity of the TA muscle here <clears throat> between the healthy person and the person who is affected by spasmodic dysphonia, you see that there is a lot of excessive muscle activity. And these are these unwanted muscle spasms that people with spasmodic dysphonia experience. Then one needs to think about what is behind it. So what is different in the processing um, at the level of the brain in people with SD? And we started looking at this um, some time ago and uh, try to characterize what is different um, before they get any kind of VTS or Botox or so what is their normal status and what you basically see if you do recordings EEG from the <clears throat> brain uh, and if you start looking for instance here at the left side of the brain at these electrodes where this is pre-motor cortex motor cortex and somatosensory cortex so that part of cortex that gets all the feelings of the body, uh, then all you see is that there is, for instance, in this alpha band, and I don't want to worry about your different frequency bands here, but what I want you to look at is if, if this is a control group activity, this is uh, uh, the activity of a group of people with SD, you see these gray boxes are a little higher than the uh, white boxes, and that means there is enhanced activity uh, in these neural networks. And what we basically see, and this is what experts will tell you, there is an excessive synchronization of these neurons in somatosensory and motor cortex um, in people with SD. And that is even happening at the time when they don't even vocalize and speak. So we understand there is a somatosensory system that provides information about the state of the body to the brain. And their brain has a motor system that tries to, in this case, speak and vocalize, turn on a certain set of laryngeal muscles to make this work. And what we're going to get in SD is people have a voice impairment. So something is wrong there. And then, what our thinking was, what happens if we stimulate the somatosensory system, which then will modulate activity in the somatosensory cortex, which then should modulate activity in, motor, uh, in the motor system, motor cortex, and will this restore or repair to some extent speech motor function in people with SD? So that's what the idea. And then what are you stimulating? What does this even mean? So for that, you need to understand that there are a set of mechanoreceptors embedded in our skin, as well as embedded in our muscle, in this case, laryngeal muscles. And 
these <clears throat> receptors, these mechanoreceptors, for instance, the one in the muscles, they really provide information to the brain about the current state of what these muscles are doing. <clears throat> and that's what we are trying to modulate, that output. So then let's think about how we do this. And what we started doing is we looked at these small uh, encapsulated vibrators, literally taped them to layers above uh, the, the larynx on the skin, and then they start vibrating. Um, and why should this even work, you may ask yourself. So you vibrate the skin, and if the vibrators are strong enough that they can actually penetrate and get to the deeper layers of the muscles, they will basically then turn on and entrain these muscle receptors. And as you can see here, that information will flow from the brainstem, from the brainstem into somatosode sensory cortex, <clears throat> and some of the sensory cortex is just adjacent to motor cortex, will inform motor cortex. And motor cortex, of course, is responsible for activity of laryngeal muscles during vocalization and speech. So we are trying to get into this circle, uh, into this network, and trying to modulate basically this network. Then one needs to think about how can one get to it. Um, and we tested in this first experiment, 13 people with SD, uh, mostly ADSD, adductor SD. Mm -hmm. They basically received um, vibrotactile stimulation. I just use a short and VTS for it in this talk for two times 17 minutes. We recorded, as you can see here, EEG, and we recorded from certain electrodes, um, above the scalp, so this is a non-invasive recording um, method, and you're getting the electrocortical activity. And here again, what happens to these people when they have a vibrator turned on? So this is their off state, their on state, their off state, their on state for three different sites. So CP, this is somatosensory cortex, this is motor cortex, this is premotor cortex. And what you see is that this theta band, this low frequency activity of these neurons will go down. They'll go down significantly. So what this means is that the application of VTS will basically suppress the excessive motor cortical and somatosensory cortical activity that characterizes its deep. So we have an understanding what it does to the brain when we turn these vibrators on. And as you normalize that activity, that's when people also will speak with less symptoms. So prolonged vibrotactile stimulation reduces the amount of theta and cortical synchronous activity. So then you want to ask yourself, does that work? I mean, do I hear something that is a better meaning? There are less symptoms uh, as a function of VTS. And I'll show you here data. And so people is, this is basically the change in CPPS, smooth sepstral peak prominence. I will not explain the details on this. Think of this as an acoustic measure of speech quality. And think of this, that if you get this dB, a change in dB of two to three, this is when other people will recognize that you sound or a person with SD will sound differently and uh, uh, speech will sound clearer and more powerful. So what did we see here? So these are individual traces of individual uh, participants. And you see some people within 17 minutes really responded quite well. Some of them took uh, 34 minutes. Um, uh, and you see a group of them clearly benefited. Others were kind of on the uptake, but we're not there yet after when we stopped stimulating. And clearly, we also have to say there's a group of people who didn't seem to benefit at all. So this is this one measure of speech quality 
And then you can look at another measure. This is for people with adductus uh, spasmodic dysphonia. As you know, voice breaks is another issue. And you will see clearly a dramatic decrease in the number of voice breaks for these people. And they will also respond. It's e more easier, more fluent for them to speak. Another group, as you can see here, did not really reduce, but they had no voice breaks to begin with. So this group that didn't respond as well were also likely people with milder forms of SD, and the amount of stimulation may not have been enough, or they simply do not respond to it. So what we basically see is that roughly two thirds of the people that we investigated in this first study responded to this one-time treatment. And I'll give you an example how it sounded in one person before and after the BTS. Tom wants to be in the army. We eat eels every day. He was angry about it all year. So that was before. Tom wants to be in the army. That's after. We eat eels every day. He was hungry about it all year. And that was after VTS. So you could see or you could hear some form of improvement, hopefully. So then let's look at the long-term effect of laryngeal VTS. So last year, I gave you a German word, Neuland, for uncharted territory. And today, I'll give you a Latin word, terra incognita, because that's, in essence, what we are entering now. There are a lot of unknowns. And what are the unknowns? So we really don't have a good handle on what are the optimal stimulation parameters as is right now. Um, so how often should it be? What's the best dosage? For how long should one do this? Um, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, an hour a day? What, what We don't know much about this yet. We are thinking about the intensity, the best stimulation frequency, um, so is there an optimal one where most people, people respond to? And then, of course, the big question is how can one deliver this in somewhat an effective treatment um, so that you don't have just a bunch of wires hanging around here uh, connected to some box? Um, so we started um, thinking about this, and as part of trying to understand this, we looked at the long-term effects of this, and this is an 11-week in-home intervention study, and Divya Bashkaran um, in my lab is going to be, or is the lead investigator and, and the coordinator of the study. And, and in this study, we basically, people come into our lab, they get an assessment, kind of the thing that you just show, uh, EEG and then vocalization and speaking, They'll take the equipment home, practice at home, come back after week six, go again um, for another four weeks, and then finally come back in, in week 11. And this is an ongoing study right now, as you see, funded by NIH. Um, and uh, I, if you're interested, encourage you to contact Divya. Then we uh, thought, how can we better deliver this? Can we make, so to speak, a wearable kind of device that will apply laryngeal vibration? So here you see these vibrators. So this is a CAD drawing uh, in the um, early design stage um, where you have a flexible uh, circuit board embedded in some kind of a color. Um, and uh, of course, that should be, you know, there needs to be power, that needs to be recharged, similar to what you can do with your smartphone with, that you just plug in. And uh, it should have a wireless panel, so which means that the user operator can 
use his smartphone tablet and manipulate the stimulation parameters of the device. So that is the idea, or was the idea, and we've been working on this. And as you can see, Arash and, and Lucy uh, done from the wearable technology lab here at the university. We've been really pushing and we're instrumental in pushing this uh, forward. And this is where we are now. So we have the electronics uh, build. Um, and Lucy really helped us to get this into some kind of wearable um, scenario. So we have now a color with a um, lightweight, washable, hypoallergenic uh, um, fabric uh, where you can basically insert the electronics that you can just take them out. So if you want to wash this color, uh, so really we also have the practical things in mind and uh, we go from here and we now have a color and you may say well this doesn't look too good um and remember this is just a prototype clearly eventually if we get to this could be all kinds of fabric colors and styles one could make but at this point we have a wearable functional prototype and i want to I want to close by this by um, showing the effect of VTS using this color from one participant who came to us with abductor SD. So this is a study that was funded or is funded by the National Space Motor Sony Association. So we're very grateful for receiving these funds. And let me uh, play this so this is the acoustic trace before vts two test sentences this is the acoustic signal uh, after vts and you'll hear it patty helped Caddy carve the turkey harry is happy because he has a new horse so this was before vts and then Two times 15 minutes VTS, and this is what it sounded afterwards. Patty helped Caddy carve the turkey. Harry is happy because he has a new horse. So I think you could clearly hear the difference. Um, so, which I think when I heard this, I was like, wow, this is really good. And I was very happy to, to hear this. Um, I also want to say that at the same time, another participant was tested who did not respond that well. So at this point, what we see is it really works for some people. We know it doesn't work for others and it works somewhat for a third group. And that's where we are and we're trying to sort this out. And clearly, um, this is a big group effort. Um, and uh, there are many smart, ambitious people in, in this group who is trying to push this forward. You saw Divya. Divya will also be here for question and answer. Um, Naveen and Lucy uh, have helped tremendously with the development. George Godding is our uh, resident otolaryngologist. Peter Watson and Yang Zhang helped uh, their speech and hearing specialist. Yang is really involved in the AG analysis. Sanas and Arash and Eileen already graduated. Uh, Sanas is now in Christina Simonian's lab. Arash just joined Facebook and Eileen is now in Singapore Institute of Technology. So they all helped to make this work. And I sincerely thank you for this, for your attention.